excited today really excited today, today to have uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Krupnik uh, with us uh, to speak to us related to trans, uh, uh, lung transplantation. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of the aspects related to COVID as well. Um, so I'll start off by introducing both of our speakers. We'll start off with Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Krupnik. Dr. Krupnik did his undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan, um, followed by his medical degree at Michigan as well. Um, he did his uh, residency and uh, sorry, internship and residency at the University of Pennsylvania, followed by a lung transplant fellowship at Barnes Jewish Hospital and a thoracic surgery fellowship at Barnes Jewish as well. Dr. Kupnik is currently uh, the um, a vice chair for academic affairs in the Department of Surgery at the University of Maryland, as well as professor of surgery at the University of Maryland, as well as a professor of microbiology and immunology. And he is a, a, a member of the Greenbaum Comprehensive Can Cancer Center at the University of Maryland. Um, and you know, it, this is true for both of our speakers. Their CVs are full of so much scholarship, mentorship, and, and so much accomplishment. So um, really looking to, forward to hearing Dr. Kropnick's presentation. Dr. Reed, um, Dr. Reed did his undergraduate degree at the University of California at Santa Barbara and his medical degree at the University of Virginia. Um, he did his internship, residency, and chief residency um, at the University of Illinois. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, University of Illinois, Chicago, um, followed by a pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Johns Hopkins University. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Maryland. He is the, I think the director of lung transplantation also at the University of Maryland. So welcome both uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Uh, Krupnik and I'll pass it on to you. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, feel free to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat and we'll uh, make sure to go through those at the end. And a reminder to send all of your evaluations to Barb when we're completed. So welcome. Well, thanks for that introduction. Um, Sasha and I love to, to, to hear ourselves talk and it's great uh, to, to uh, have other people engaged in that. Um, uh, this, this is my favorite presentation. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll begin with that. Um, <clears throat> so I, we have no disclosures and these are the learning objectives that are CME required for, uh, for the presentation, but we'll touch on all this. Uh, and, and this is our team, uh, and uh, that, that's my contact and Sasha's contact down there. This slide will appear at the end of the presentation as well, uh, if you if you miss the opportunity to write down our our emails. Um, so, in terms of what we'll talk about, we're going to talk about uh, just an overview of lung transplant in general, uh, some guidelines for referral. We'll talk about COVID a bit, and uh, and then we'll we'll have a little bit of. Uh, a few slides on our, our own program here. So beginning with the overview, I'll hand it over to Sasha. You can just tell me when to go to the next slide. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> just a little bit of historical. This is something that's, uh, I'm kind of a history buff. So the first, the modern era lung transplantation actually started with uh, my mentor, Joel Cooper, who'll actually be giving a talk here in January. He is in his mid eighties, but still robust and literally stopped operating a couple of years ago. The first lung transplants were done by him and his team in 1983, including a single, uh, which was the first one, then double lung transplant. In 1989, the whole team moved to Washington University in St. Louis. And a lot of us, uh, myself, Chris Lau, and a lot of us here trained with Joel Cooper at St. Louis. Go to the next slide. So actually, if credit is due, the first experimental lung transplants were done by uh, pioneering Russians. I'm of Russian background, so uh, Russian experimentalist. But really, the first success was by probably the most underrated academic surgeon, James Hardy, who was the chief of uh, surgery at the University of Mississippi. He's a Penn alum. He did the first human lung transplant in 1963 didn't have modern immunosuppression. So the patient got thymic radiation, high dose prednisone, high dose uh, azathioprine and died at three weeks, mostly due to lack of uh, adequate immunosuppression. Ironically, the same day, 
uh, uh, the, it, it's exa exactly the same time they were doing the transplant. Uh, one of the civil rights uh, leaders was shot. And actually, the resident who was scrubbed in the first human lung transplant had to scrub out and go to the emergency room to help uh, with resuscitation. So this was actually overshadowed based, uh, there were a couple more done, but again, without modern immunosuppression, which didn't occur till the late 70s, uh, this was not feasible. Next. <laughs> If anybody's interested, this is a wonderful uh, book. I'm a history buff uh, by Jim Hardy. And uh, he did a lot of firsts, did a first xenotransplantation. So he's probably the most underrated uh, academic surgeon out there, but did a lot of firsts. Next. Um, Rob, that's you. So uh, I have a, a few slides here just on background of transplant. Um, th this is conceptually where the anastomoses occur. Uh, and um, a single lung transplant uh, has three anastomoses, there they are, um, a bilateral, obviously uh, you do the same thing on the other side. The incision that's made um, is, is either a lateral thoracotomy or this clamshell incision. Um, and what the clamshell looks like is that, uh, it, it gives pretty good exposure. Um, just some, some visualization of the surgery itself here. In terms of the transplant itself, it, it has really, kind of uh, boomed and, and uh, grown every year. And the growth you see is primarily in the purple. That's a bilateral lung transplant, which has really become the favored transplant uh, largely at, at most programs for a variety of reasons. Uh, the primary reason being that uh, the survival is, is better. Um, you can see the conditional survival and the conditional survival here means that if, if your transplant recipient survives the first year, which is the, the year that is um, a bit steeped in risk. Uh, the immune suppression and the surgery uh, are um, at the highest risk around that, that first 90 days, really. But if, if, you're, if your recipient survives that first year, um, the median survival is 10 years. That's pretty good. Uh, now, the, the, um, this difference between a bilateral and a single is, is explained in large part by um, uh, other factors, uh, including um, the, uh, the the characteristics of the recipient. Older, more frail patients are, are typically given a single lung because it's a lesser operation. Um, although we've actually uh, had uh, great success in doing bilateral transplants in older population. Um, Sasha did a 72-year-old a, a couple weeks ago, and, and, and he did both lungs in, um, in about three and a half hours. Uh, typical is eight. Um, so Sasha is fast and able to get a, a, a patient through the operating room quickly. That patient is home already and doing great. Um, when we look at the uh, indications for transplant over the years, um, there was a change in 2005. Uh, and that change was the way that allocation occurred uh, began to favor this, uh, this blue here, and that blue is the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, or, or IPF. Uh, uh, we, we typically, we, we've gone to calling it IIP rather than IPF because by the time they come to transplant frequently, uh, the diagnosis kind of merges. If it, could, it can be advanced hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It can be in-stage interstitial disease from uh, anything, and it gets kind of lumped into this. And that's really become the, um, uh, the, the annual highest uh, transplant um, diagnosis. But in the history of transplant, COPD is still a major, uh, a major um, diagnosis. And those are, those are probably the two that we do the most. Um, we're not a cystic center. So this purple band in the middle of cystic uh, is, is significant as well although it'll be interesting in the days of Tricapta to see how this uh, pans out in the future. Um, over time, uh, uh, you can see that outcomes are improving uh, just through improving the, the quality of, of care, improving familiarity, improving um, uh, just the whole process of delivery of, of these lung transplants. It's, it's hard to attribute any individual uh, change that's been made in the in the practice of transplant medicine to, to this improval over time. Um, and you know, it's a kind of a busy slide. You can see that the, the most modern era ends earliest because there just isn't as much follow-up time. So if you look kind of here at three and four years, you can you can see that there's clearly a march 
um, towards better survival. So the, the old survival data used to be quoted median survival of, of five years, and, and it's, it's better than that now. Um, in terms of survival, according to different indications, here it is. And, and, uh, and you can see that cystic fibrosis is it's young people that, uh, that typically do very well with the transplant when they get one. Um, this uh, IPAH, that's idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, there is an early mortality. They're, they're, they have a bumpy course immediately around the transplant period, and that, that can be problematic. But if they get through it, they actually experience a survival similar to cystic fibrosis. And, uh, and then you have these, the, the other um, conditions that, uh, that fall kind of into a, a, a different pattern. And that's because a lot of the COPD and, and interstitial patients have more comorbidities. They're older and they have uh, typically smoked and, um, uh, and there's more coronary disease. Uh, <clears throat> age matters. This is an adjusted a multivariable regression looking at five-year mortality. And you can see that um, you know, this, this inflection upwards at the lower limits is, is really primarily due to uh, uh, different indications and, and severity of illness uh, that is taken on and, and risk uh, that is um, accepted by, by programs such as ours for patients in their, in their 20s and 30s uh, that, that wouldn't be taken in, in patients that are a little bit older. Uh, you can see the inflection point up here when you get up to uh, the mid 60s and, and older. Uh, patient, older patients do worse. That's nothing novel. Uh, now, some programs will, will look at this and, uh, and kind of draw a hard line in the sand and say, well, we won't transplant people over 65. Uh, we, we don't draw arbitrary um, uh, uh, exclusions like that. We will consider patients on, a, on an individual basis. And our fundamental question isn't how old you are or, or whether you have uh, something like that. We, we ask whether the transplant will do you more good than harm, and that's our, our primary uh, criteria for uh, selection. And here's, here's a slide where it, it, it looks at the outcomes after transplant in terms of uh, what's, what's the expected quality of life, and this is a Karnofsky score. It's, it's explained over here. The red are, are just completely normal people. The, the yellow is um, uh, you know, they're, they're imperfect, but they're, they're awfully good. And, um, and then you get into this purple and it's cares for self, but and unable to carry out normal activity or active work. Um, and you can see that, that, uh, that it's the majority of people have a, an awfully good outcome after transplant. And these patients are, are all, uh, disabled and pulmonary cripples, uh, when we meet them, um, Referral guidelines, we'll touch on this uh, a little bit and I'll give you some of the background on the, um, on the papers that informed these referral guidelines. These were written initially back in 2006. They were uh, revised in 2014, but largely reiterated. There was a real anchoring bias where they just looked at the prior work and, and didn't change a whole lot. And if you really dig into uh, a lot of the data informing uh, the initial recommendations back in the first uh, consensus guideline statement. Um, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty small, but it was the best information they had at the time. So in, 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 to, to, to make it as simple as possible, these are really the indications. You really have to in, have in-stage lung disease. You have to have no other medical options. It's, and, and, uh, and as a rule of thumb, if you look at your patient, you say, you know, it's a, it's, a fair probability that your lung disease is, is going to take your life within two years, then we ought to be talking about a transplant. Um, and I would even say that if you look at your patient and you think on a five-year uh, timeline, that might be a, a, a good time to at least begin the conversation with the transplant uh, team, um, because uh, an early conversation is, is very important. Sometimes we get patients that, that really need some optimization and it can take a year for them to lose weight, get in shape, um, which is hard to do when you don't have good lungs, uh, but we have tricks up our sleeves to make that happen. Um, so the absolute in quotes, I, I actually cut some of these because in the old uh, guidelines, things like hepatitis C and HIV were absolute contraindications and now they're 
they're, they're um, considered relative contraindications, so I've removed them from this list because those are curable or, or treatable at least for HIV. Um, malignancy is, is a problem. Uh, the immune suppression that we give with uh, transplants it, it kind of unleashes malignancy. It makes it more aggressive. Uh, so it, it, it kind of depends on the malignancy. Skin cancers, uh, basal and squamous cell are, are a problem, but they are not necessarily a deal breaker. Other malignancies that have a high uh, probability of recurrence um, would, would portend a, a, a futile endeavor of, of transplanting them. So it's generally considered a problem. If someone has really bad kyphoscoliosis, and that's the, the primary limitation or major limitation uh, to their uh, respiratory mechanics, a transplant doesn't fix that. So those kind of things um, would be a problem. If, if the diaphragms, if there's bilateral diaphragm paralysis and the lungs are okay, you obviously don't get any benefit from a transplant. Non-adherence, you know, if you don't, if you can't take your medicine after transplant, you reject, you die, it doesn't help you to get a transplant. Um, and uh, same thing there, inadequate social support. If, if a patient is living alone, um, uh, it, they, they can run into problems, they can get confused uh, with their medications and, um, and it's living with someone can be the difference between being found sick and being found dead. Uh, so we really require people to have pretty good social support, people that can um, help them out when they're sick, help them with their medications, uh, get them to their appointments. Um, substance addiction, there's, there's an arbitrary six month uh, 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 that they, they need to be um, uh, tobacco free and they need to not be using any kind of substances as well. Um, the, uh, so any other major organ system that's untreatable and untreatable advanced, uh, you know, there on occasion we can do a, a kidney and a lung for an otherwise compelling patient. Um, uh, but if you, if you have a cirrhotic patient with uh, lung disease, we probably uh, are not going to be able to help that patient. If, uh, if they have heart, lung, and they're, and they're young patient, then we could do a heart, lung transplant. There are some, uh, there are some options for patients with uh, a couple of organs. Um, and you know, we often don't consider it uh, another organ system, but it should be considered another organ system, particularly in the days of COVID, uh, the, the musculoskeletal system. So if somebody is extremely uh, debilitated and doesn't have a lot of rehab capability, uh, just from being paralyzed and prone for a month, uh, it, it is a, a major barrier to success. Um, <clears throat> if they have a non-curable chronic extrapulmonary infection, <clears throat> that's a problem, obviously. Relative contraindications, uh, age over 65, as mentioned, there are some programs that, uh, that won't even contemplate uh, a transplant in, in, in an amazing 70 year old, we're not one of those uh, uh, programs. Um, critical or unstable, if, if your patient is on ECMO, uh, it, it, it's gonna take a pretty compelling patient uh, to, to succeed. Um, poor rehab potential as mentioned before. And if you're colonized with problematic organisms, if you've got a multi-drug resistant acetobacter, um, it, it can be uh, a disaster to uh, give you the immune suppression necessary to prevent rejection. Obesity, uh, we, do, um, we, we do kind of draw a, a line in the sand there, although if, if one of the Ravens linebackers came in and their BMI was 36 uh, and their pure muscle, uh, we, would, we would probably consider that patient. But uh, for, for people with a BMI over 35, we, we typically don't offer them a transplant. We offer them um, assistance in losing weight in a healthy way down to a threshold where, uh, where we can uh, expect a successful transplant to occur. Um, osteoporosis, uh, we can work with that, but it, uh, it, it also is uh, a problem. Um, mechanical ventilation uh, is a relative contraindication as is ECMO. And, and any other uh, medical condition lacking optimization uh, listed there. These are all made worse by transplant. Um, you know, I think that uh, esophageal dysmotility and esophageal problems uh, you know, wasn't really on the radar of the, um, uh, of the uh, 
uh, the, the folks writing the early guidelines should probably be on here. It, it's a major problem. Um, uh, maybe GERD is, is capturing that a little bit. Uh, those, those folks that have swallowing problems and a lot of acid reflux uh, can be transplanted, but they're often committing themselves to uh, uh, being fed by a, a peg tube rather than by mouth for quite a while. And if they can't commit to that, then it can portend a, a problem because if they if they aspirate, they just get recurrent events of, of uh, aspiration, pneumonitis, and um, and it'll lead to rejection of the lung and, and a bad outcome. It's so mostly problematic in your scleroderma patients, uh, and it, um, it, it the, the gut does definitely function less well after a transplant, and, and it can be a, a, a three month, six month uh, stent on a, a feeding tube for some people. It's kind of a classic slide in transplant. Um, there's a risk of being transplanted too early. Obviously, I, I you know I could be transplanted now and I'd be great uh, in terms of transplant. Uh, the, my long-term longevity would be reduced considerably. We don't want to shorten people's lives, uh, and the risk of the transplant itself um, is, is uh, needs to be factored in versus the risk of the disease. The the conceptual um, slide here is, is uh, kind of shows you the, the disease course of a patient, uh, just as an example of you've got the too early to transplant where you might actually shorten their life. Um, and they've got the too late where they've hit the point where they're so sick that uh, we can't really help them. Um, and then you've got the sweet spot where you can, uh, where you kind of see what's coming. They're still strong this is your IPF patient that just starts oxygen. You know, the, if you were prescribing oxygen for somebody with an interstitial disease, they probably need to meet uh, me and Sasha unless there's a clear reason why a transplant can't happen. Or if, you know, when, you're, when you're prescribing uh, OFEB or Esbriet, it, it's probably a, a good time for them to also hear about other options if, if those options are um, ones that would, would make sense for them if they're not you know, 88 and frail. Um, so we'll go through the indications um, for different uh, different transplants, and um, and I'll give you a little background on how those indications were uh, come up with. Um, so COPD, the the pink puffer blue bloater, classic netter pictures. <clears throat> Our own Steve Sharp here at University of Maryland actually took care of this guy that Netter used uh, as a as a model for this. Um, uh, for this drawing and says that he looked exactly like that. Uh, so um, don't want to leave out the ladies. The COPD is, is actually uh, more common in women than men at this point. Um, thanks, Virginia Slims. Uh, so in, in summary, uh, COPD, these are the guidelines. These are the recommendations. And, and I, I, I'm using the 2006 guidelines. They were changed a little bit in 2014. Some of the changes were uh, were a little bit silly, uh, but the, the core of it was all here. And um, yeah, the, the, uh, the recommendation was if you have a Bode score of, of five or greater, you ought to go ahead and refer your, your COPD patient. And then there are recommendations for transplant timing. And I'll include those as well, because uh, sometimes if, if, if you don't recognize uh, the, your patient as meeting one of these referral criteria, recognizing a transplant criteria like, oops, I should have already referred. Um, and so the, there's this recommendation for both score of seven or more, and, and I'll get into that. Uh, and then there's this recommendation that if your patient has ever been hospitalized and manifested hypercapnia with a CO2 over 50, uh, that that may be a, a, an indication that the transplant timing should be sooner rather than later. Pulmonary, the presence of pulmonary hypertension and, and this kind of odd appearing criteria that, that may make sense if you recognize it from the net trial. Uh, but if your FV1 is less than 20 and, and you either have the DLCO less than 20 or homogeneous emphysema, these are your criteria that preclude uh, lung volume reduction. Um, and uh, and here's, here's your BODE if you forgot what this is, this, this paper. I think is uh, from back in 2004. I think this is kind of what uh, what made Bart Shelley kind of a rock star in, in this this publication. He uh, kind of uh, he was already reasonably well known, but this this really kind of launched him into the extremely famous category. If you live in the world of COPD, 
um, and and here are the points on the boat index. It's the, dictated by FEV1, the distance walk, the MMRC, and the body mass index. And this was way overplayed on the boards for, for like a decade after this publication that you could get one point for being skinny. Um, wow. <clears throat> so uh, MMRC, I, I'm probably more familiar with it at this point than I am with the New York Heart Association because I use it more. But uh, if you're more familiar with New York Heart Association classes, these are kind of rough equivalents, uh, but that's the MMRC scale. Um, MMRC has also been adopted into the CAT scoring uh, or the, uh, the, the, um, the gold scoring for COPD, so it, it should look a little bit familiar. Um, and here was the idea behind the recommendation that you should refer at a bode threshold of five, is that that would put you into the quartile three or four, and here's, your, here's the predicted survival based on the observed Kaplan-Meier from Bartcelli's original publication. And there's the quartile four uh, that's at a threshold of, of, uh, of seven or more that, that's been used as a reason to, to transplant. And it was as simple as saying, look, in 36 months, 50% chance of survival, that's, that's worse than, than the expected outcome for transplant you know, back then. Um, there are a few problems with any of these. And uh, anytime you look at a Kaplan-Meier and you use it to extrapolate to uh, a population of lung transplant um, uh, candidates, it's, it's problematic and, and there are issues of general, generalizability. Uh, patients that are considered candidates for lung transplant can't have cancer, they can't have really bad coronary disease, they can't have active smoking, they, they, they have fewer comorbidities than the general population. They, this population here that Barcelli was presenting in this Kaplan-Meier um, they weren't non-smokers. They didn't have uh, the. They hadn't passed through that lens of filtration to get to transplant. And so, um, one of the things that we posited was maybe our transplant uh, candidates actually have a far better survival than would be predicted by the Bode score. And it and it actually is is exactly the case. The red line is the survival of patients that are uh, waitlisted for transplant with COPD. And then the green is, is that original um, uh, validation cohort from uh, Barcelli's paper. Um, and this is, we did a competing endpoints analysis. So transplant uh, is obviously a competing endpoint to death. So we did a fine and gray analysis to show that, uh, that this isn't um, confounded by uh, transplant as a competing endpoint. Um, and we showed that there was about a six fold better survival in those patients uh, that are uh, listed for or considered candidates for transplant than, than the uh, Bode score would predict, which makes the Bode score maybe not the best thing to, uh, to use to prognosticate. And um, got to publish with Bart uh, in, in chess. That was kind of a fun paper to write. <clears throat> so the, the recommendation about hypercapnic respiratory failure in COPD comes from this publication. And this was uh, about a thousand patients with COPD this was back in the late 90s, back before home non-invasive ventilation was as easy to come by. Um, and, and this was that threshold of 50 mentioned in the guidelines. And it was mostly chronic hypercarbia, uh, but the mortality was pretty significant. At one year, it was almost half uh, of, the, of the patients that presented this way were, were dead. Um, and Again, there's some issues with generalizability, but it's, uh, it does uh, indicate that you have patients with very limited pulmonary reserve, and uh, that might be um, a good reason to, uh, to go with transplant. <clears throat> um, uh, pulmonary hypertension has long been known to be a, a prognostic importance in COPD, and, and here's one of the early uh, pre-oxygen uh, uh, observations, and it, it holds true even after long-term oxygen therapy has been um, uh, implemented, the, the patients with pulmonary hypertension and COPD do worse. And so that's one of the indications to consider a lung transplant as well. This was from the NET study and, and the surgical arm versus the medical arm in this subgroup with the very low FEV1 and the homogeneous emphysema or the very low DLCO. Uh, uh, the, the, the surgical uh, arm did worse. And, and this, that was, uh, this was the information that informed inclusion of that criteria 
in those guidelines. So these all come uh, really from those those three studies. Uh, um, and so it's the, the data are a little bit soft. There's a little bit more art uh, that, uh, that needs to be incorporated into the science, but these are the guidelines. And I think that just uh, recognizing that, uh, that you have a patient that's sick is, is probably the, the best way to uh, you know, make your referral. So here's your um, IPF or idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, this fibrotic NSIP and, I, and IPF clustered together in terms of your referral. And uh, the recommendations on when to refer is really when you diagnose. If you have a diagnosis of UIP or fibrotic NSIP, the day you diagnose it is the day you, you uh, refer them for uh, a, a, a consultation for transplant, unless there's an obvious reason why a transplant um, is not an option for them. Um, and then the timing for transplant is, is more complex. Uh, for UIP, there's this DLCO threshold of 40, 10% um, uh, FBC decline. You know, if your DLCO is trending down, pretty much anything that's trending down um, that says my patient is getting worse, if their oxygen requirement is new or, or progressing, any of those are, are triggers that, that you ought to move forward. Um, hypoxemia, even during a six minute walk test is, uh, is an indication that your patient uh, should, should be transplanted sooner rather than later. Um, <clears throat> honeycombing, so we can just look at the CT and if it is an extensive degree of, of uh, damage that, that is considered um, an indication to go ahead with a transplant as well. For fibrotic NSIP, uh, this DLCO threshold is a little bit lower and that 10% uh, decline in the, in the vital capacity over six months holds true. The, these recommendations come from Kaplan Myers of, of relatively small observational studies, uh, and, and here they are. You know, the, this was a this was actually a larger uh, observational study, just trying to get a sense of how long patients with uh, IPF live. It was 900 patients, and the median survival here was almost four years. The problem is this was an overestimate of survival because it was cross sectional in 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 its enrollment, it was it wasn't um, just incident; it was incident and prevalent cases. So prevalent cases are those who are going to uh, survive longer, and the the longer you survive, the uh, uh, the more likely you are to be captured in this. So it skews towards a better survival, um, but it, it creates a good bookend to say that uh, that uh, you know of the patients that you've got right now, that this is kind of the the better uh, predicted survival that you can expect, and this is really true for IPF. You really do have kind of a plateau and then these drops. Uh, and if you have somebody with IPF that has one of these drops that has a, an IPF flare, you treat it, you get them back uh, into their, um, into, uh, their, their home, and, uh, but they have maybe a little bit more oxygen requirement. That's really telling you that you destabilized and, and it's time to consider moving forward with a transplant. Um, and here, here, what I was mentioning, the, the Kaplan Myers uh, showing the, these declines in vital capacity. Uh, there's a couple of uh, papers here that have shown that that decline of 10% uh, kind of matters. I would argue that this decline of zero to 10% is uh, um, is is something to certainly keep an eye on. And um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it certainly justifies doing frequent. Um, uh, pulmonary function tests in these patients because you can pick up on these changes and uh, oftentimes the DLCO changes even before the vital capacity does and it can really tell you what's coming and, and, and when to expect your patient to kind of hit the wall. Um, the, uh, and these studies were, were pretty small as well, but what you can see is that in the patients with uh, NSIP and, and IPF, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the change of 10, of 10 percent um, mattered here in, in these studies as well. This was 179 patients. Um, and then this was the DLCO uh, data that informed that recommendation of 35 percent for NSIP, because uh, you can see that it, it, you know, the, the Kaplan-Meier is, is poor. Um, but uh, 
these these recommendations came from an experience of 12 and 16. It's not it's not super robust. And I mean, your anecdotal experience, at least mine, because I do this work with uh, uh, with UIP and NSIP already exceeds what the published <laughs> data right here are. Uh, but I, I think that just recognizing that that DLCO as well as the DLCO trajectory can be very informative about when is the right time to uh, to move towards transplant with the patient. Hypoxia during a six minute walk test, there were, uh, uh, there were uh, these observations that um, if the SAT was less than 88, it was considerably worse. You know, sick patients do worse is kind of a theme in publications. Uh, there are quite a few of those out there. This was kind of interesting though, the distant saturation product. Um, I do, there are some issues with this around, around transplant because uh, our ideal transplant patient would actually be somebody who can walk a really long distance, but they, their oxygen is awful. And we have a lot of those patients because we work very hard to keep our patients robust, healthy, physically fit, other than their lungs. And, um, and we, we spend a lot of time improving their, uh, this distance saturation product. But this is a six minute walk test where you take the distance walk in meters and multiply by the lowest oxygen saturation on room air. And if, the, if that number is less than 200, they fall into this category rather than that category. Um, so there's your summary and, and you can take it with a grain of salt as you want. Uh, I think that the important thing is the referral timing earlier is better so that there's room to uh, uh, optimize these patients for a transplant as well as to uh, be able to be cognizant of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of how we can optimize them for a transplant. Um, the transplant evaluation is, is kind of an extensive battery of tests and, and uh, it can't, it's, it's challenging to do it quickly. We would have to admit a patient to the hospital uh, to get through it in a week. It frequently takes a month, several months to get through as an outpatient. Uh, so it, it's best to start that process early. <clears throat> All right, so this is the next condition. Um, and if you can see the lumpy bumpies through here, you can probably guess that this is sarcoid. Um, so sarcoid, the, the recommendations for referral are New York Heart Association three or four, uh, despite um, optimal therapy. Uh, the, the threshold to transplant them are hypoxemia. So if you if you meet, if you get a sarcoid patient who is hypoxemic, uh, it's a reason to refer as well. Pulmonary hypertension, another reason to refer. That right atrial pressure over 15 indicates that your right heart is beginning to fail. Um, uh, your next indication here, if you know what this is, is a, a big um, a pulmonary artery with um, uh, that, that's become um, really. Uh, uh, problematic, all the blood, these little blood cells are trying to get through that thing and, and they're doing their best. This is idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, and it's kind of similar to uh, sarcoid referral guidelines that uh, you have to have uh, optimal therapy, obviously. If, if you're failing Rivadio and you've tried nothing else, then um, sure, send the patient to us, but we'll tell you, you got to fail Flowland or equivalent uh, to, to really uh, be sure that you're helping the patient with a transplant. Um, rapid progression is, is obviously a, a good reason as well to get that patient into uh, the, the realm of transplant. <clears throat> so when the transplant is, uh, is either that you, know, you, you can kind of remember this easier by thinking if, if you can walk 360 meters, you can live 360 days, um, but if, if you're less than that, then you ought to go ahead and get a transplant. If, uh, so, so either you have poor reserve or you have a, a trajectory you don't like. That's, that's the rule of thumb that I think is probably the most useful. They have to be failing something like Flowland or equivalent. They have to be failing the optimal therapy low cardiac index, high right atrial pressure, those can be reasons to transplant as well. Um, <clears throat> moving on to COVID, I'll, I'll talk briefly here. Uh, this, this is supposed to be a little animated graphic where it starts popping up COVID, but I don't think the animation is working, so I'll skip it. Um, I'll, I'll just go over a couple of cases that reflect our experience here uh, at Maryland and hopefully 
we'll have a, a couple of moments for comments. If, if there are comments in the box, I'm not seeing them. You can feel free to unmute yourself and stop me. Um, this was a, a young man, 24 year old from Georgia, uh, from uh, before vaccines were um, widely available. And uh, he got COVID in, in April and was cannulated. This was mid-April and he was cannulated for ECMO. His lungs just uh, failed rapidly as, as we see repeatedly play out during the pandemic. He was cannulated about two weeks after he was admitted to the hospital. And he developed pneumothoraces and VRE bacteremia, pseudomonas pneumonia. The wheels fell off the bus. He was paralyzed, prone, and, and super deconditioned. He had bradycardic arrests. This is something that we've seen repeatedly is, is these bradycardic events um, that seem to be something uh, directly cardiac uh, in addition to um, the, the propofol and, and Presidex that people are maintained on. He had pacing wires placed for that. And he was transferred to us on ECMO in mid-June, uh, quite deconditioned. Um, this is him. Uh, you know, he, uh, I'm, I'm including pictures of him because he, he He's kind of come out as a big vaccine advocate and has made his story uh, public. He, he, there are a bunch of news stories about him. This was him having a good time in Florida. Uh, he was actually very cautious around the pandemic, but then went, went to one concert um, and took his mask off and the rest is history. Here he is on Vapotherm for that two week window uh, before he crashed. Uh, and this is how we got him. Yeah. He's got your, your ECMO cannulas and he's a little bit of deminous and he's, he's weak, but he, he's awake and he can talk to you and we could, we could uh, have a conversation with him. <clears throat> and this was his CT scan. Uh, you can see the, the usual chest tubes in place and he's got uh, this characteristic pattern. These patients often have an upper lobe and an anterior uh, uh, predilection to develop these little blebs that will pop and, and lead to pneumothoraces and, and bronchopleural fistulas. Um, and, uh, and there's his pacing wire right there and his ECMO cannulas. Uh, went too fast. Uh, so that's his lung when it came out. Um, he, we, we uh, try as we could, uh, his lungs were just shot. Um, they, this, they cleaned this up considerably when it was on the back bench after removal. It just looked like a little red piece of liver. Uh, there wasn't much to it. Um, he got his transplant. And uh, uh, even though he was markedly deconditioned, uh, we were willing to uh, take a risk on his degree of deconditioning because he was 24. And 24 year olds are damn hard to kill. Um, this was supposed to be animated. Let's see if the animation works. This is him learning how to walk again after not having walked for several months. We have a pretty robust uh, support at the um, at Kernan, the, the University of Maryland Rehab Orthopedic Institute, uh, which is where this was shot, uh, is, is very good at getting people back on their feet. Um, and there he is uh, recuperating after his transplant, happy as a clam. So in um, Let's see. Oh, I thought I had another slide on him, but I don't. Um, so case two, here's a man uh, with who's, who's 50. So this is a little bit older gentleman than, than our last. And he got COVID in January of 2021. And uh, he was intubated about 10 days later. He, he ran that course of, of getting really sick, really fast. And he developed these pneumothoraces on both sides with just an enormous air leak. We were consulted um, around this time because they couldn't ventilate him at all. His oxygenation wasn't terrible, uh, but he, he had these huge blowing air leaks and they, they consulted us for ECMO and they consulted us for transplant um, because uh, they were concerned that there was no other option. Um, and and he, was, he was really unstable. By the time we were consulted. He was also, uh, he, he was so sedated, he couldn't talk to us. And he, he was not like the last one. We couldn't even have a conversation with him and talk to him about his preferences for transplant. He was extremely deconditioned, couldn't lift his bed, his arms off the bed when we lightened sedation. Um, 
And here was his scan. Uh, if, if anything, it looks maybe worse than the last case. <clears throat> and you can see that, again, we've got these, this upper lobe with an anterior uh, kind of predilection for this stuff. And you've got some lower lobe uh, traction bronchiectasis beginning here. Um, and these pneumothoraces that sit up here are, are a challenge, couldn't, couldn't be ventilated. Um, there were some problems in moving forward with him. Uh, he wasn't yet six weeks out from his first uh, uh, COVID um, test. This was in the early days of the pandemic. We, we had to work in a multidisciplinary fashion with our transplant ID folks to come up with an algorithm of how to move forward with patients uh, with COVID so that we didn't just transplant them and then have them die of, uh, of a virus that was still in their system. And this was the algorithm that we that we came up with here. Um, so this gentleman, uh, to review the timeline with him, he he had COVID in mid January. Uh, he actually uh, never required a transplant. We we just proned him. Uh, those upper lobe anterior blebs will frequently respond to proning. Uh, we put in some interbronchial valves as well. They they were partially helpful, but uh, the proning really allowed those bronchopleural fistulas to heal, um, discharge him to home two months later, and he never got a transplant. So we, we consider this a, a success. You know, we, we don't just transplant. We're not a barber. Um, you, know, you don't send somebody to us and, and we, we give every patient a haircut. We, we will do our very best to try to salvage a patient without a transplant when possible. CT on this patient was repeated in June. And this is interesting because this was his CT that I showed you before. And you can see there was some of this traction at the bases. It's not normal, but uh, most of these abnormalities that we would have thought would be fibrosis and scarring are not. Uh, they actually recover and the lungs look much better than you would expect them to. Here's another slice even farther down where that, there was this little patch that looked like traction and irreversible damage and a paired uh, slice from his later CT. Uh, a lot of this may be surfactant dysfunction leading to a collapse of the alveoli and traction that, um, that does not reflect uh, fibrosis. Um, so how do we predict who's gonna live and who's gonna die? Who, who needs a transplant and who can be bridged through? Uh, that's, uh, there's an art to it and, and a lot of it is anecdotal experience right now. And a lot of the publications are look what we did kind of publications. There is this preset score idea that, that pertains to ECMO um, and that you calculate it like this. There are online calculators for the preset score. Um, this was adopted a little bit by our ECMO folks here at Maryland um, and you know, Ali Tabatabai and 16 of his closest friends published this experience um, uh, pertaining to the first 40 ECMO COVID cases. And, and what they say is that the outcomes have really improved uh, since then, uh, uh, largely because of um, selection. You know, they, were, they didn't really know who was the ideal candidate to bridge to uh, recovery um, at, at this point, and, and they've become a little bit more selective. So it does make it harder to get patients in, uh, but if you get your patient in and on ECMO, um, they're, they're uh, what, what their more updated uh, data uh, would suggest is that 70 to 80 percent of those people will ultimately um, uh, go home. Um, 33 of these 40 uh, at the time of analysis had had ECMO discontinued um, and 18 of those were survivors. This is 18 of the 33. So these other these other seven, we don't, we don't know what happened with on this publication, but there were about half survivors. And, and again, this was the early experience and they're doing better now. There were 15 deaths. And it seemed like that preset score uh, was indicative of who was going to survive and who's going to die. There were other things that were indicators of death, the, that the development of those pneumothoraces was a negative pro prognostic indicator. Um, failure uh, to uh, observe improvements in the compliance it was another indicator of, of mortality. Another example of the sicker you are, the, the more likely you are to die. Um, so I'll hand it over to Sasha here uh, to talk about our amazing program. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, so our program's gone through a lot of changes, and uh, Rob and I are both new. We've been, uh, uh, well, Rob's been here, but he's uh, uh, the new uh, medical director of the Lung Trust Program, and one of the things that's changed, and one of the reasons I was recruited by Chris Lau, who's right there in the center. She's actually a chair of surgery and she's a lung transplant uh, surgeon as well. Uh, we trained together in Gerald Cooper at Wash U uh, a couple of years apart. And we really wanted to grow a program and truly make it a program. So you see, there's a couple of people on there that um, uh, whose pictures we don't have. There's also two more NPs we are looking for. So part of the reason is we think that lung transplantation access is difficult in Baltimore. In fact, looking at similar cities with similar populations, the numbers and accessibility to lung transplant should be two or threefold. So I think there's a lot of people that we could help that aren't being helped and are probably dying not knowing that this resource is available. So that's what we wanna let you know. We're ramping up a team. Uh, we have a commitment from the institution. They wanna grow the program and we're happy to see anybody anytime and evaluate. Obviously uh, nationally, about 10 to 20% of people referred for lung transplantation actually turn out to be lung transplant candidates, but we're happy to see anybody and we'll call you and give you an honest opinion. If somebody's not a candidate, here are the reasons. This is why age, comorbidity, coronary disease, malignancy. Um, and there's our referral not line and uh, we have uh, coordinators available essentially at time. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Rob. One of the things that uh, we're uh, uh, focused on here is not just the clinical care, we're also focusing on basic understanding and uh, basic research as well as uh, clinical research. And one of the things that uh, we brought here is a lab that studies essentially what should be lung specific immunosuppression. And part of the reason as Rob showed you is that long-term survival of lung transplantation is probably the poorest among all organs. The only organ that really mirrors it is small bowel. And they're both these mucosal organs that are constantly exposed to the environment. So we have some hypotheses that simply decreasing non-specifically uh, the immune system is actually damaging to the lung. Go to the next slide. Uh, we actually developed a model. Miki Okazaka was one of my fellows who, when we were at Washington University, developed a mouse model. We do a lot of modeling and the mice actually really mimic the human situation. Next slide, Rob. And uh, we have multiple uh, uh, lines of investigation funded by the NIH, as well as private institutions, individuals, as well as foundations that focus on unique immunological aspects of the lung that make it different than heart, lung, kidney. And we're starting to develop immunosuppression strategies that will be working and I wanna call them more tolerance strategy rather than immunosuppression strategies that will be lung specific. They may apply to the gut, but might not necessarily uh, uh, apply to kidney or some of these other organs. Next slide. We also have several inve investigator initiated trials. Chris Lau has an R01 for a clinical trial where we're studying a drug, uh, adenosine, which is an uh, um, uh, uh, essentially uh, agonist of uh, adenosine receptor, ragadenosine, which is a drug that's actually used for imaging, but given in higher doses, we've shown that it can reduce ischemia reperfusion injury. We have an active trial going on right now. Next slide. And we have a very good partnership with lung bioengineering. A lot of the lungs that are considered marginal for transplantation, we will, our team will go out, we'll harvest, and we will put them in ex vivo lung perfusion, which both dries the lungs out um, uh, uh, and essentially evaluates them whether they're suitable for transplantation. We usually do about a dozen to a half a dozen a year. These are organs that are considered a little bit high risk, but we bring them back, we uh, uh, perfuse them, we assess them, and a large number of them will be able to put into the patients to benefit our patient population. Next slide. And again, this is uh, our team, uh, 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 some of our team, uh, the team is much larger, but these are the only people that can make it to the picture. So um, that's really all I have. We have any questions? Uh, thanks very much for such a wonderful uh, presentation. We have a, um, oh, okay, that's your your message in the, in the chat. So please, the chat is open for anybody that has any uh, uh, questions for our presenters. Um, I guess I'll get it started off. Thank you again. I really liked the, the melding from the medical and the surgical side, hearing both sides and hearing the COVID experience as well. Wondering both, 
sort of anecdotally and what the data is about socioeconomics and lung transplantation, meaning, you know, what are the barriers in terms of uh, geography, where you live in the country and socioeconomics and, and who seeks liver transplant? Uh, yeah, thanks for, that's a great question and I appreciate it a lot. Uh, our, our program actually, that's one of the great strengths of our program. Uh, when we compare our program statistics against the, the programs across the country, um, we serve a far greater proportion of, of minorities. Um, we we uh, will take on patients that don't speak English. Uh, that, that is a, a barrier uh, and it makes it a challenge, but it's one that, that we uh, have developed some ways to work around and, and we've, uh, we've got quite a number, primarily Spanish speaking only uh, patients that, that we're able to take on and, and help out. And, um, and, and that's definitely something that I've seen other programs struggle with and, and not uh, be as, as enthusiastic about taking on. Um, the uh, socioeconomic barriers are, are, are real. You know, if you can't afford your, your medications after transplant, it's a disaster. Um, it, it's kind of odd. Uh, Medicaid, we have a number of Medicaid patients and, the, and they can actually afford it. Medicaid is actually not a bad insurance. The, the, the times where we struggle, and we had this happen a couple of weeks ago where someone only had Medicare and they didn't have a supplemental and that only pays 80% and then it leaves a 20% gap. Um, and, and we don't have a workaround for that. We ended up... Um, Rather than just saying sorry, you have to die, uh, we we worked really hard to find that patient uh, a way to get a supplemental insurance. The only one they were able to get was Kaiser, and uh, and Kaiser doesn't uh, doesn't work with us. They they work it with UVA because when Sasha was at UVA, <laughs> he worked uh, uh, with uh, with the, the inst institution there to um, uh, to bring in a, a Kaiser uh, affiliation, and so now. Um, We're working on switching that to us. It's just a little <laughs> bit more bureaucratic. Uh, it'll take a little bit, but soon. We'll get it. But, uh, but we sent that patient down to UVA to be transplanted. And, and, and I think that was a, another success for us because you know, we, we don't stop it. We can't help you. If we can't help you, we'll find a way to help you is, is sort of the approach that we take. Um, and uh, um, that was a long-winded answer that allowed me to move past the question. Was that, was that, did I answer your question there? Yeah, absolutely. Because it feels like lung transplantation in particular, I feel like it's sort of different than liver, that there seems to not be early referral, early assessment and early evaluation. Um, and so along that line, is it similar to liver in terms of regionality of organs and all of that? How does that work in terms of lung transplantation? Yeah, it, it actually, it's kind of, so one of the things that's happened and one of the reasons actually I move here is um, the allocation rules change in 2017 uh, based on a lawsuit in New York. So before, and liver I think is going the same way or maybe is already gone. Before you had your uh, United Network of Organ Sharing is divided into 50 regions, kind of loosely mirror states, but not exactly. And it used to be that no organ could escape your region without exhausting all the recipients. And it became a very apparent, it was a very unfair system, especially in Manhattan, people were dying and right across Hudson River, people with much lower acuity were getting transplants because it was a different uh, OPO. And there was a lawsuit, so now it's a 250 mile rule. So when we list a patient, a line is drawn 250 miles around our patient, our institution, and the person with the sickest score gets the first crack at the lungs. And that's one of the things Rob didn't point out. If you look at our program compared to all the other programs, our lung allocation score, the degree of sickness is statistically higher. We are much more aggressive. Uh, we are not conservative and we believe, look, there's patients that have four, five, six months to live. We'll give them a shot if there's no absolute contraindication. So that's one of the reasons we've been able to benefit is by having sicker patients. About a third to maybe 40% of our transplants is off of ECMO. They are so sick that they have to have ECMO beforehand. So we've been uh, doing well with getting the lungs with this new 250 mile rule, which has benefited our program and has benefited the sickest patients. Um, overall in the country, that has driven perioperative mortality higher because the way to get success is to transplant a patient who's at home, not sick. 
that's how you're going to get great outcomes, but then the sickest patients are going to die. So it's a fine balance uh, that's uh, going into play. But our strategy is we're going to go after the sickest patients, uh, and that's where our institution fits in. And we feel that it's our mission to serve everybody in Maryland. The state sponsors us for that reason and to try to take care of the sickest patients that have no other choice. But we would love early referrals. We'd love nothing more than to evaluate the ILD patient early because the worst thing is they have an ILD crisis. They end up on ECMO and uh, we have to work them up in house. Uh, it's very emotionally hard uh, uh, rather than work them up early. We don't list them, but we have all the dots checked that if they do have a crisis or they rapidly deteriorate, essentially all the boxes are checked, we can list them pretty quickly. Thanks very much. Um, and last question, just the role of the transplantation in our current era of COVID. What have you seen in the past, like I guess, now that we're approaching a year that the vaccine has been available, are the numbers stable? Have they increased or decreased over this past year? Oh God, we get a call. We get, we probably get a call every other day. Um, my, my patient who didn't want the vaccine regrets it. Can he have a transplant? Uh, and so far we have not been able to help many of those people. Um, we, uh, it, it's, it's rare. We have had a couple of patients, uh, I got a call last week where there was someone who was a, a vaccine refuser who um, was sick and the family is still vaccine refusing. And, um, you know, I said, you know, there are a number of reasons why we couldn't help that patient that were medical, the kidneys were failing and the platelets were bad. But, uh, but I was like, I, you know, I transplant a patient and just put them right back into the lion's den and, and have them get COVID again. Uh, it's, it's, it takes a toll on us to, uh, to, to contemplate that. So there's, there is, it's, there are a lot of very challenging issues to navigate. Um, we, we have the, the stance that we've taken with, uh, the vaccine refusers and, and virtually all of the patients with COVID, uh, that are being referred to us in the last month or two have been vaccine refusers. Um, nobody else, uh. And the, the stance that, that we've kind of taken with that is that <clears throat> it's like it's like smoking. Um, bad mistake, it's stupid. Um, if you quit and you, and you change your ways, we're not gonna hold it against you. If you recognize that it was a mistake, we'll, we'll do our very best to help you out. If you stick to your guns and you double down and you say, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna work with you medically, we're not gonna take your medical advice, we're not gonna listen to you on this, uh, we, we, we put that sort of in the category of medical non-adherence and we can't really work with you. Um, so that's, uh, uh, it, it, I'm hoping that uh, as, as this pandemic moves on into the endemic state, uh, that, that this won't be a continued problem. Um, I think that virtually everyone out there is either gonna get the disease or get the vaccine. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so the, we, we, we're going to continue to have some cases here and there, but hopefully it'll become much more of a sporadic thing like, like, uh, like uh, ARDS after flu uh, is. All right. Well, thank very much to uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Kropik. Really wonderful presentation. Thanks for spending this past hour with us. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank for you. Bye -bye. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.